Russia claims it's building a fighter jet that flies at Mach 5, shoots lasers, and hunts American satellites in near space. They call it the MiG-41, the ultimate sixth-generation interceptor. But there's a problem. Russia can barely produce their current fifth-generation fleet. So is the MiG-41 a genuine threat to U.S. air dominance, or is it just a billion-dollar bluff? Today, we're separating physics from propaganda. For years, the Kremlin has maintained a simple line. The POC-DP is just a concept, a paper airplane, years away from reality. But the observable activity around Russia's aerospace facilities suggests a far more complicated reality. Recent satellite imagery at high-security test locations has captured several unfamiliar airframes. These shapes match no aircraft publicly acknowledged by Russia. Long, narrow fuselages, oversized intakes. These designs point toward sustained thermal stress, traits associated with next-generation interceptors, not standard fighters. At the same time, short clips recorded near engine test stands showed exhaust patterns inconsistent with the Su-57 or MiG-31. Those clips were scrubbed from the internet, but not before analysts archived them. Russia has provided no explanation, no photos, no prototypes displayed, only the steady phrase, work continues. Yet behavior inside the Russian military structure has shifted. MiG-31 units are adjusting patrol sectors. A 50 AWACS are altering their coverage arcs. Arctic bases are expanding high-altitude support zones. These movements are subtle but they align with preparations for a platform operating above the current inventory. Welcome to Military Power. Tonight we examine how a next-generation interceptor, if it is indeed being tested under the radar, would fit into Russia's emerging operational concepts, and more importantly, how it acts as the keystone for a broader strike framework that analysts believe is quietly taking shape. If the POC-DP is real, even in early form, it changes how the opening phase of a modern air conflict would unfold. Before we talk about how Russia might use POC-DP in a real strike environment, we need to confront the part that analysts often overlook, how a system this ambitious could even be built under current industrial conditions. Because if POC-DP is real, even in early form, it would represent one of the most technically demanding aerospace projects Russia has attempted since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Hypersonic thermal shielding, high-altitude propulsion, new long-range interceptor missiles, onboard computing capable of tracking hypersonic targets. None of this is routine, especially under sanctions. And yet there are several facts that make the prospect surprisingly plausible. To start, the fundamental mission requirements of PODP are actually very clear. Intercept ballistic, cruise, and hypersonic threats at extreme altitude. Reach speeds projected between Mach 3 and Mach 4 Plus. Operate above 25,000 to 30,000 meters, where drag decreases but thermal stress climbs. Carry next-generation long-range missiles, potentially with fragmentation or kinetic kill-vehicle warheads. Serve as the top layer of Russia's long-range air defense framework, replacing the MiG-31 by the mid-2030s. None of these capabilities are conceptually impossible for Russia, because several of the building blocks already exist. The MiG-31's engines, airframe philosophy, and mission profile provide a foundation. Russia's work on hypersonic glide vehicles has advanced their understanding of materials under extreme heat. And their S-400 and S-500 programs have pushed radar, guidance, and interception logic further than most observers expected. What is surprising is how the industrial side of this puzzle fits together. The war in Ukraine revealed something uncomfortable for Western intelligence agencies. Russian weapons, especially drones, contained a staggering number of foreign components. Microcontrollers from Texas, flight processors from Taiwan, navigation modules from Switzerland, power converters from Japan. In theory, sanctions should have cut these supply lines off years ago. In practice, Russia rebuilt its logistics through third-party countries, front companies, civilian supply chains, and mass parallel imports. The implication is clear. If Russia can source microchips for tens of thousands of drones under wartime pressure, it can very likely source the specialized electronics required for high-end aerospace research. Not illegally, simply through global markets that don't always track end-user destinations with surgical precision. This matters because POT-DP is not cheap. The projected cost per aircraft, if the POC-DP reaches an operational configuration, will almost certainly exceed the MiG-31's inflation-adjusted unit price. 
roughly $70 to $90 million today. Current analyst modeling places a likely POC DP unit cost in the range of $130 to $200 million per aircraft, assuming low production volume, exotic materials, and next-generation propulsion. For comparison, operating costs would also rise sharply. Annual flight hour expenses could plausibly fall between $35,000 and $55,000 per hour, significantly above the MiG-31's roughly $25,000 to $30,000 per hour though still below the extreme costs of U.S. experimental hypersonic platforms. Analysts further estimate that engine maintenance cycles for an aircraft capable of sustained near-hypersonic speeds, with turbine and inlet temperatures approaching the limits of current metallurgy, could resemble those of early U.S. hypersonic test programs, where major overhauls were required after tens of hours, rather than hundreds. This would place unusually high pressure on the sustainment budget, potentially exceeding $5 to $10 million per aircraft per year, even at modest sortie rates. But here is the crucial point. Russia has shown repeatedly that cost does not stop them from pursuing strategic prestige projects. The Su-57 continued development despite delays and budget strain. The Sarmat ICBM, Poseidon Strategic Torpedo, and Zircon hypersonic missile each survived heavy sanctions because they serve national-level objectives rather than commercial logic. PODP fits that category exactly. Its development is a matter of doctrine, not economics. So, how could Russia shift from concept to prototype? It begins with the simple fact that the Russian Air Force already operates a fleet designed around extreme altitude interception. The MiG-31 is still one of the fastest operational fighters in the world. It fires the R-37M, the longest-range air-to-air missile in service. Its patrol patterns over the Arctic form the backbone of Russia's long-range early warning system. PODP would not replace that structure. It would extend it upward. The aircraft would likely adopt a long, slender fuselage optimized for supersonic wave control. Air intakes would be large enough to support a new generation of variable cycle propulsion capable of sustained high-mach crews. Internal bays would house extended reach missiles that use advanced seekers and perhaps distributed kill logic warheads designed to engage maneuvering hypersonic threats with multiple intercept points. All of this aligns with what Russia has publicly stated. They want an interceptor capable of engaging hypersonic weapons and even low-orbit satellites. The step from this concept to reality is steep, but compare it to other next-generation programs underway around the world. The United States is developing the NGAD ecosystem, including long-range interceptors and sixth-generation fighters. China is advancing its own high-speed designs tied to H-20 bomber development and new air defense doctrines. Japan's Mitsubishi and Europe's FCAS program are building advanced materials and propulsion concepts for their future fighters. Russia is not alone in pursuing extreme altitude capability. The difference is that Russia frames POC-DP not as a multi-role fighter, but as a pure instrument of strategic air defense, a machine built to shield the North and shape the early minutes of any major conflict. Analysts believe Russia is shaping a doctrine in which POC-DP's role is not to escort bombers or dogfight fighters, but to disrupt the enemy's entire sensor network, you know, to push AWACS aircraft back, to neutralize supporting tankers, to intercept long-range missiles before they enter glide phase, to compress the enemy's situational awareness during the most critical minutes of a conflict. This is where the aircraft earns its strategic value, not by striking cities or bases, but by dismantling the architecture that the U.S. and NATO rely on to coordinate everything that follows. A platform like that does not need to be produced in huge numbers. Even a small fleet, 10 to 20 aircraft, could alter regional calculations in the Arctic, the Pacific, and the Northern Black Sea Corridor. And that brings us back to the core question. Is POC-DP truly being built? Under sanctions? Under pressure? Under global scrutiny? Given what we know about Russian procurement patterns, sanctions evasion routes, long-range priorities, and decades of experience in high-speed airframes, the answer is simple. If Russia believes this aircraft changes the first five minutes of a war, they will find a way to build it. It starts with a shift that most radar operators would miss. It is 3 a.m. over the Barents Sea. A NATO coalition force is conducting a freedom of navigation exercise. 
The airspace is dominated by the Western standard of air warfare, the combat cloud. High-altitude E-3 Sentry aircraft and British E-7 Wedgetail platforms are data-linking targets to the F-35 squadrons below. KC-135 Strato tankers orbit 400 kilometers to the rear, keeping the strike fighters fueled. This is the ecosystem Russia avoids confronting head-on. So they initiate Project 5.12. Two MiG-41 interceptors lift off from a hardened Arctic base at 0312. They do not level off at 12,000 meters. They climb. Engaging their ramjet propulsion phases, the aircraft punch through the tropopause, settling into a cruise at 45 kilometers, an altitude where the air is too thin for standard turbofans, but where the POC DP's thermal shielding and high temperature materials are designed to operate. Their speed stabilizes at Mach 4.3, closing distance at nearly 1.4 kilometers per second. The target is not the F-35 fighters. The target is the network's spine. Before the E-7 Wedgetail and its MESA radar, capable of detecting high-altitude targets out to 600 kilometers, can establish a stable lock on the low RCS signatures, the POC DP flight leader fires, the weapon R-37M NATO AA-13 axe head, speed Mach 6, range 400 kilometers, warhead 60 kilogram fragmentation payload. The missiles fall from near space in a steep intercept trajectory. NATO reaction time is measured in seconds, not minutes. The AWACS platforms roll cold and dive to break lock. The tankers immediately initiate retrograde protocols, pulling more than 800 kilometers rearward. Suddenly, the F-35 and Typhoon formations are isolated. Their God's eye view dissolves. The Western strike package fractures across the battle space. But the West has spent years preparing for this scenario. 0318, the US Navy fires first, an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer, tracking the thermal bloom of the hypersonic pack dp engines through infrared sensors, launches the RIM-174 SM6 Block YB. With its 53-centimeter motor, 21 inches, and extended altitude envelope exceeding 33,500 meters, 110,000 feet, it is one of the few operational interceptors capable of chasing a MiG-41 into the stratosphere. Simultaneously, British Typhoon fighters respond. They cannot climb to the POC DP's altitude, so they weaponize the combat cloud itself. They launch the MBDA Meteor, range 200 plus kilometers. Propulsion solid fuel ramjet. No escape zone, three times larger than the AIM 120 AMRAAM. The Typhoons fire on the POC DP's predicted vector, letting the Meteor's active seeker and data link fuse the picture in real time. If this engagement occurred in the Pacific, the geometry would be entirely different. China does not compete for altitude. China competes for reach. The PLF would not deploy a fighter to intercept the POC DP. They would launch the PL-17, CHAA-12. Length, 6 meters. Range, 400 plus kilometers. Guidance, AESA seeker plus satellite data link. While Russia tries to dominate the vertical axis at 45 kilometers, China dominates the horizontal axis by saturating the combat zone with long-range AWACS killers. Their doctrine? Prevent the enemy from ever coming close enough to launch. The metrics are extreme. Mach 4.3 cruise speeds, 400-kilometer missile envelopes, engagements at near-space altitudes. But the question remains, is any of this real? Russia is still struggling to produce the Su-57 felon at scale. Can they truly manufacture a fleet of hypersonic near-space interceptors requiring exotic alloys, advanced composite thermal skinning, and microelectronics far beyond what Russian industry can reliably produce under sanctions? Is the POC DP an emerging apex hunter of the stratosphere? Or a budget-driven mirage designed to force the United States to spend billions accelerating NGAD? There is a razor-thin line between a prototype and a superweapon. Right now, Russia keeps that line buried in the Arctic fog. Subscribe to Military Power and activate notifications. We go beyond the headlines. We dissect the physics behind the conflict. 